November 1991, Red Square, Moscow. With the collapse of communism, freedom returns, including the freedom to demonstrate for a return to communism and to the principles of this man, Joseph Stalin, communism's high priest. Forty years after his death, in the hearts and minds of countless Russians, Stalin lives on. So powerful is the myth surrounding him, the myth created by Stalin himself, that many on this day would readily trade their newly won freedoms for a return to the iron-fisted rule of a Stalinesque dictator. Well, you should see clearly, political figures must be judged by the results of their specific political activity. I'll explain myself. In 1953, when Josip Stalin died, all the world was on its knees to us. Churchill and Roosevelt were crawling on their bellies to our power. Now look what we have today. Under Stalin, the metro was built and eight high-rises. The best we have, everything happened under Stalin. Stalin's technique for shaping the mass consciousness was highly effective, even by the standards of today's Washington myth-makers. It is rooted in the Bolshevik Revolution of 1917. Control of the mass media is key to Bolshevik strategy. The daily press trumpets the promises of Comrade Lenin, the party leader. He pledges land to the peasants, factories to the workers, and a paradise on earth. To dramatize his story, Lenin also mobilizes the arts, welcoming those art activists who will labor for the Bolshevik cause and liquidating those who will not. Lenin's message is that of all revolutions. Kill the fat cats, the establishment, the crybabies. Workers unite for the struggle. This means you. Lenin now focuses his propaganda machine on his most powerful rival, the church. There can be no authority higher than the Bolshevik state. God must go. So must his hated icons, the symbols of Russian spirituality. They must make way for the new gospel. Whatever serves the purpose of the revolution is moral and desirable. Lenin also despises the intelligentsia, saying they are not the brain, but the excrement of the nation. To which young Joseph Stalin adds, the intellectuals must be useful to our cause or obliterated. Russia's intellectuals by the hundreds flee the country. Sergei Rachmaninov, the brilliant composer. Vladimir Nabokov, the writer, with his parents. Marc Chagall, the painter. He escapes with his wife to Paris and becomes world famous. Before departing Russia, Fyodor Shalyapin, the renowned opera basso, encounters Stalin in the Kremlin and has a premonition. This man Stalin, he says, will blow up the church of Jesus Christ the Savior as casually as he strolls along in his soft Caucasian boots. The church of Jesus Christ the Savior is the symbol of Russia's spirituality and military glory, built with money donated by the people to commemorate Russia's victory over Napoleon, created by Russia's best architects and sculptors, its friezes and statuary, the labor of decades. Its destruction would be unthinkable, an atrocity. When Lenin dies in 1924, Stalin seizes power. Now it is he who must find a way to impose his will 
on this vast, unruly country, with no means of mass communication, and upon the minds and hearts of its 160 million ethnically mismatched people. From this day forward, nothing must cast doubt on the principles of the Stalinist regime and its politics. It must be understood that only Stalin is capable of leading this nation to glory, that his judgments are infallible, not to be questioned. Stalin knows better than even Lenin how to engineer this feat. He will fashion a colossal illusion, a mythology more vivid and plausible than life. And to do it, he will tame and harness the arts and the press. Every writer, painter, composer, architect and sculptor in Russia. Stalin begins by forming a ministry of ideology to ensure that nothing will be created, no book, poem, drama, painting, ballet, construction, symphony, film, nothing that does not reinforce the myth. Stalin is to enter the home, mind and heart of every person. To do this, one of Stalin's first moves is to install a nationwide radio network. Every backwater village in the land now hears the daily voice of Moscow, eulogizing Stalin and demeaning his enemies. And the day will come when listeners to foreign broadcasts will be shot by order of Stalin. Writer Yuri Karyakin recalls. The radio suddenly appeared in this backward, mute country. These saucer-like receivers informed the people about Soviet victories. It was like a voice from heaven. There was something religious about it, a system of instant notification, unheard of. Receiving these broadcasts created a kind of mysticism in this remote Asian land. There was something terrifying about it. I remember that feeling. I remember what that saucer meant.